Hello, this is Greg from another Bibliophile Reads and Randy from the Literate Texan. Hey, everybody. Hey, and today we are going to be doing a little book talk of a book that we read as a, a buddy read. We have not talked about the book yet, but we're doing John Irving's The World According to Garth. Published in 1979, and it won the National Book Award. It's great, too. It, it is a good book. Now, this is my second reading of the book, and I believe it's your second reading, too. It's my third. Third, okay. I read it when I was 12, and then I read it again in my 20s, and, uh, and well, now, I read it again now. Yeah, well, I read it in in the early 2000s, 90s. I'm sorry, the, the early 90s. But but what what's funny is that when you mentioned it when you first read it in 12, that in the the copy that I have, there's an introduction from John Irving who talks about his son reading it when he was 12. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And how you know it wasn't necessarily a book written for a 12 year old. No, like, it's not that in the introduction, and it's it's certainly not. I mean, I know I was like. What's he talking about there? What's but right. uh, but I love I loved it at age twelve. Well, you know, when I was twelve years old, Mark and Mindy was still on TV, and Robin Williams was in the movie version of the World According to Garth. And so I thought it was just a really really big comedy. But uh, and it, I think it qualifies as a dramedy, no doubt. But I think it would it would skew more towards the the. Uh, you more towards the drama side of things, I would think. Yeah, he's, I, I don't think Irving is intentionally comic in the ways like um, the Confederacy of Dunces is comic. It's just, right. it's when you read it, the situation is so absurd and so bad that you laugh. Yeah. It reminds me of Kafka. There's a story of Kafka reading his stories and breaking down and unrelenting fits of giggles because it's just so horrible it's funny mm. yeah well kafka there's an experience kafka's probably kafka was probably a lot, of, a lot funnier before it came true you know <laughs> please so because i can't imagine that that any time has been more kafkaesque than this no i mean just just our political situation in the United States is like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll try to stick to Garp and not get to Yeah, it. yeah. Let's, we'll make another video about Kafka. <laughs> we'll make Kafka and all, all, all the, the, the strange things that are going on. Okay. Also, what I really loved about the introduction was John Irving said when he wrote this book, he, he wrote it from, you know, to project a feminist point of view. And his comment was, you know, this book is going to be obsolete before it's published because right. he said the world is heading towards progress and they're going to look at it and be totally forgotten right and how wrong he was about that oh without a doubt yeah yeah in fact in some ways well things have gotten better obviously but there's a huge percentage of, of the society that doesn't believe that things have gotten better i know and people who want to go back to the way that it was and, and again, that brings back to the comedy. You're laughing at it because it's just so absurd. Yeah. So what, what I really like is John Irving excels in characters. I mean. Yeah. He, the, the, Jenny, the mother, is like, he wind up reading and said, you know, she's a really odd duck, but I, I could, I could. I could just totally understand her living in her own world and always insisting on wearing the nurse's uniform everywhere. Right, yeah. Well, you know, because she's played in the movie by Glenn Close. Okay. And I've seen the movie often enough that it's hard for me to picture other people as the characters. But Glenn Close was perfect in that role. But, uh, but yeah, I love the, Yeah, and she was quirky. But she doesn't seem as quirky now as she did in, what, 1979? 1979, All yeah. the world in 1979 in a lot of ways. Indeed. And um, 
of course, there's a character of Garp himself, which is, I don't know, is um, is he supposed to be John Irving in a way? You know, because... Well, you know, yeah. I mean, he has to be John Irving in a way because, I mean, he he's a writer. You're right. And then you look at the title of, of at least one of his stories is The World According to... Well, I'm not there, but it's a different character. Oh, the, the book within the book? Yeah, th there's a there's a, there's a book within a book, and then there's a story within a book, which was the first time I'd ever seen that, too. Right. But uh, but that makes it pretty clear that there's, even though even though Garp insists throughout the book that this isn't, he's, he's not an autobiographical writer, which I think is one of the things that irritates John Irving, too, is if you assume that he's not a biographical writer, but Obviously, he's pulling from his own life. I, I think I think it's true. Yeah. I was, just to get prepared for this, I was doing a little bit of research on you, know, just looking up at Wikipedia. And um, I guess John Irving never knew his biological father. And Nor did I. What? Nor did I. I was adopted. Okay. I mean, my biological mother, but not my biological father. But in this case, he asked his... Asked his mother, he said, are you going to tell me? And she said, no. He says, right. well, I'm going to write a story about that, who my biological father is. And right. I guess she says, go ahead. <laughs> Make him up. Make him up. Bring anybody you want him to be. Well, I, 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 I just can't imagine anyone making up a father like technical Sergeant Garp. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, uh, Irving is a quirky writer, and his quirks come through consistently through a lot of his books, too. And and the one I'm thinking of is the bear thing. I think there's a bear in every single one of John Irving's books. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I saw an interview with him one time where someone asked him, what's up with all the bears? And he said, man, I just like bears. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't <laughs> Uh, I've only read three of his books. I've read um, this one, the hotel, not the hotel, the, the Cider House Rules. Okay. And um, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Okay. Well, see, I've read the Hotel New Hampshire, too, which is marvelous. Yeah, it's really good. And I believe that was his novel right before. And then uh, Last Night at Twisted River was one that I read recently, too. And I, I say recently, this year. And it was really great. And then, uh, you know, another really good one is the uh, trying to say Piggy Sneak, which I think is just such a great title. Okay, that, I, I, I think isn't that a collection of short stories or novellas? It is. Yeah, yeah, it's a collection of short stories. And then I read his memoir about the film industry, which was also really interesting because I guess he covers mostly the filming of. Garp and the Cider House Rules. And then uh, he touches a little bit on the Hotel New Hampshire, which was made first, but it wasn't a it wasn't a big box office draw at all. Yeah, see, I see. I I've I have seen the film of Garp once. I don't really remember it clearly at all. Right. But when you remember talk about the bear character, is that um I never saw the movie, but I guess it was Natasha Kinski played the bear character. Right, yeah, in the Hotel New Hampshire, right? In the Hotel New Hampshire. And she, 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 when I was in high school, it was like, oh, she was the, the hot actress that all the all yeah. the girls were um, fawning over. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how could you not? She was in Cat People, too. I, I'm going to say Cat People, of course. Yeah, so, but... Um, but yeah, man. Well, and that is the thing about the world according to Garp too. I think is that it is all about the characters, and the plot comes from the characters' quirks. They absolutely do. Every I mean, moment of the plot comes straight from the characters' quirks. There's, it's just, you know, it's not a plot-driven novel at all. Although there's plenty of plot there, but it's definitely character-driven. I know. I mean, we're we're I was talking about the I guess the most infamous scene in the novel. Imagine reading that as a 12-year-old girl. Huh? <laughs> and 
And it has such an aura of inevitability. It did. It's, it's like everything led up to this, and you, this was just going to happen. Yeah, I, I, it, that was my one criticism of that scene is that he just put too many, so many pieces of the puzzle in this to one scene to right. get one action. And yeah. it's, it's like being on the driveway where you can coast in and, you know, right. coast in. And, and then, then you have there, their, of course, their affairs that they're, they're both having and that he finds out about it. And then he, the, the the guy, I forgot the name of the character, who, who insists, well, we just have to have one last. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the college student. The college student. And it, it turned out because it, it's just such an iconic scene and it's hilarious, but he, he struggled a little hard, at least, at least in my opinion, for it to, to be totally believable. But I guess you can do that in novels to get that, that reaction. Yeah. The other thing that I thought was really nice about that was that they managed to stay together after all that trauma. They did. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I guess in real life is when you have something like that, it's like a child die, it's almost always ends in a breakup. Oh, yeah, yeah. Major changes are like that, too. And, you know, I, I struggle with my weight, and I have a friend who had weight loss surgery, and he was going through the counseling for that, and he told me, he said, something like 80% of the people who lose over 100 pounds wind up divorced. Hmm. You know, and it's not necessarily them that divorce them because they suddenly have more options. It's just suddenly there's a change in the dynamic of the relationship. Yeah. So, you know, but I can't imagine a more dynamic change in your relationship than that, especially considering, you know, the questions about culpability involved there. I mean, whose fault was it? Well, it was everybody's fault. He, he, that was the part he, everyone was equally responsible. Yeah. For, for, for that accident. Yeah. But what a great bunch of characters, too. Um, yeah, also, Dart's a cook in the book. You know, he's always cooking. Yeah. And I know from, from various interviews with John Irving, he's, he's also an accomplished home cook. Okay. And that's a big plot point in Last Night at Twisted River because it's about a, a father, a son, and a grandson. And the father and the son are both cooks in restaurants. Right. And I believe John Irving was also wrestling coach. Yes, right. yes, absolutely he was. Yeah. Um, one of his first books was called The 158-Pound Marriage. Okay. I thought it was a terrible novel. But I don't think I really realized where the title came from until much later because it was a reference to the guy's career. Because, you know, they write the wrestlers by weight. Okay. I mean, I, I, I wrestled at, like, summer camp as a boy, and that's, you know, one month of wrestling training and then never stayed. But My cousin and I watched uh, wrestling or professional wrestling on TV as kids because, you know, in the 80s it was all about the Von Erics, and, and we, would, we would try to do the moves from TV. It's America. We can kill each other. Yeah, well, that's so different. I mean, the same thing at all. No, I mean the, the the actual sport of wrestling is just. And what I what I really liked is like when when Garp was struggling to find a sport, mm -hmm. and that he 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 didn't want a team sport because he just didn't feel you could he was a team player at all. And then, right, didn't want to do anything with balls, right. So that because I, I I had totally forgotten when I picked it up that um that he was a wrestler. I said reading through it, I said, oh why not wrestling? Now it could have just been my brain in the back saying you know where it's going and yeah. not the solution before it happened. But that was great. Now one of the characters that I that really surprised me was Roberta. Which one was Roberta? Roberta was the, the transvestite. Or the oh, trans that's right. Yeah, yeah. Probably about John Lipkin. Right. And what, in for the Phillies or something. Whatever, the, the ex-football. Yeah. And what a great character. And it, what really surprised me, this was written in 1979. Yeah. And I, I know that is, like, like the, the transsexual is, is really big right now. 
It's like all the pot, all the pot, all the cool writers are doing that. Oh yeah, yeah. But he was way ahead of money. He was really ahead of them, and he he treated her just like an ordinary human being. Right. And I and part of that was saying like this is 1979. This is, and here here is John Irving saying this is how you react to this character, and you. I mean, I don't know how people reacted to her in 1979. I don't have any sort of historical, if there were these people who were absolutely horrified that Garp's best friend was, you know, a transgendered woman. Well, and they mentioned that several times in the book, how this is Garp's best friend. But as near as I can tell, that's Garp's only friend. You're right. You know? What's his only friend? I can't think of another friend that he had in the book other than his family member. You're right. I can't I can't either. The only one that came almost close was um when he picked up his son from his friend's house in the middle of the night. Mrs. Ralphie? Mrs. Ralph. What a great character. Yeah, she what a great, great sad uh <laughs> yeah, sad, interesting, realistic character. Indeed, and and the the guy she was with popped up a few times in the story, and he almost became a friend of his. Well, that's right, yeah, because he went and lived out there at uh, the home that uh, Jenny had. Right. Briefly, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I forgot about him. Well, you know, and he was kind of a he was kind of a jerk, but not when you compared him with the. The guy that Mrs. Garp was was having an affair with. That guy was a real jerk. Which one was Mrs. Garp having the affair with? Uh, he was the, uh, the the undergraduate that uh, was in her class. Oh, oh, the, and no, he had oh, the big station wagon. Mrs. Garp. Yeah, I thought I thought Mrs. Ralph did. Like, did she have another affair? But no, the the undergraduate student. Yeah, he was. He in some ways he got what he deserved. I think. Well, I don't know if anyone deserves that, but uh, a little harsh. But but that's something else I noticed about Irving's approach to all the characters. Even that character is treated with kindness and sympathy. He is. You know, he's a human being, and he's horribly flawed, just like all the characters in the novel. But still, you know, I, I didn't come away from it thinking, "Oh, he's a lass." You know, he, he he really deserved that. I came away from it thinking, "Well, he's kind of a jerk." Ooh. Yeah. And whatever happened, I mean, I know at the end of the, the book, he, he did a he did a replay of interesting what happened to all the characters. Yeah, I yeah, I thought that was really neat too. It is, but I don't think he mentioned him. No, in fact, I, I think he mentioned him, but very, very briefly. Yeah. You know, it was very, very briefly, but I thought I can't remember the name of Garp's wife. But uh but I, she she lived. She had the most detailed. <clears throat> so, uh, well, she, yeah. she 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 had a, a longer life than a lot of the other other. Uh, yeah, she, she wound up an elderly, happy woman, you know. So, but uh, yeah, it's such a great book. I, you know, I was thinking about it the other day. I loved it when I was twelve years old, and I loved it when I was in my twenties. And a lot of books aren't like that. You know, uh, I read, okay, uh, for example, I read Pierce Anthony's science fiction novels when I was in the early teens, oh, yeah. 13, 14. And right. going back and revisiting, I'm like, oh, God, what crap. But even some really good stuff like The Catcher in the Rye, you know, that spoke to me as a teenager. But as a 40-year-old man, I reread it, and I was like, yeah, I'll never read that again. There's no detail. But The Great Gatsby and The World According to Garth, they just keep getting better every time I read them. They do. Now, now I have to admit that I, I think I like a prayer for Owen Meany a little better than Garp. I mean, I mean, I mean a prayer. That is for a Owen, great book, isn't it? It really, I mean, that that's the first one that I read. Yeah. And I read that in my 20s, I think. And there, there's something about the, the, the these books that he has this entire world that he draws you into. Right. And that is our world, but it's unique to him with his characters that just yeah. 
these characters with these huge quirks. Well, I've heard about him being compared to Dickens very often. And and I can see that. I mean, his novels are long, and they've got really quirky characters in them, and they cover a long lifespan, too, which they I do. think is pretty common in, in Dickens as well. So. It is. Now, I when you think about it, the, the three books that I have read all cover that long lifespan. There's no... Right. Short, short little plot because he's he's taking you through the characters' lives and how they develop, yeah. and how they change, and yeah. For, well, and in this case, in the world according to government, from the time before he was born, you know, it covers his entire life, literally. Indeed. You know, and uh, you know, Ann Tyler does the same thing in a lot of her novels, but not necessarily all of them. But she'll often cover entire families for their entire life too so uh but she's, she's a lot more prolific than uh john irving i think uh irving's got what 14 novels and ann tyler and tyler is cranked out something like 30 or 31 yeah but his novels are twice as long as hers that is true yeah yeah so so here's here's another question is um in the novel garp becomes a very famous novelist right but with a very short, a very little amount of works that he actually wrote. Right, yeah. And from what I gather is that his best piece of writing was his first piece of writing that he wrote in Vienna. Right. And everything else we just said, well, it's sort of, and the thing is, that story in Vienna was good, but it, it was not as good as the world according to Garp. Right, right. And I'm trying to figure out, is Irving trying to say something about when we praise authors as being great authors? Right. Are we really praising them? Are we praising their works? Because honestly, the, the, the three books, novels that Garp wrote sounded pretty bad. Well, I don't know. Now, the third novel, The World of Corey, I don't know, <laughs> Benzenhauer or Brunhauser. Yeah, um, and of course you only get the first chapter of it, but then you get a plot summary after that. That's a novel I want to read. I want to read that one, but you know, it would not have been a masterwork of literature. It would have been oh, no, no. it would have been a garbagist material. Right. Yeah, but I would enjoy the hell out of reading that one. You know? I would have enjoyed it immensely. I could just I could see myself picking it up and enjoying it. But I said, you would not praise Garp as being a great writer for that book. And the critics right. said, well, it, people are going to read it like mad, mm -hmm. but it's not great. And the second book just sounded pretty awful. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. First, and, it, and his first sounded just like an ordinary novel. So why did Garp catch on to the world? I mean, is, it, is that John Irving's talking about something about the literary world, about how we view our authors? Well, and, and I guess the, you know, his mother writing the book and her book becoming really popular spurred him to bigger success. Yes. You know, it wasn't, and, and, and you know, it makes you wonder about someone like Joe Hill, for example, Stephen King's son. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Joe Hill, I think, writes a, a fine horror novel. But would, but, but I mean, does he write appreciably better than anybody else in the industry? Or is he partially famous because of his famous father? Well, I remember when Joe Hill first started writing, he did not tell everyone who his father was. Right, right. But you can sure tell by the author photos because he looks just like him. He could, but, he, but at least I appreciate him saying, look, I'm under my father's shadow. Right. And in my father's genre, I'm going to see if I can make it on my own. Right. And, you know, my guess is his father probably helped him. Not necessarily. He had to open some doors for well, I don't know if he opened door, but writing advice. Yeah. Now, yeah. This is how you get things done. Because there's one of his books, um, The Fireman, I think it was, that someone said it, it really reads like his father. I mean, right. he's doing everything his father did. I think Joe Hill's a lot tighter than, than Stephen King. Okay. Some of that early Stephen King stuff was, was really tight, too. It was just over time, you know, it's just like, well, 
we can't edit him. He's Stephen King. Well, that happens to a lot of. I mean, that that, that just happens to most famous writers. You yeah. tell it as they say, "We're not cutting anything." Right, right. Well, I guess when you you're famous enough that they'll pay big money just for your laundry list. Yeah, you know, sort of thing. So, okay. But I don't know. You know, my understanding is. Uh, and I haven't read enough of them to know, but my understanding is that, that Irving's novels have grown longer and more self-indulgent over time. And that his most recent one, I think it's called The Last Chairlift, is like 1,200 pages or something, and it's a drag. You know, it made, that sounds enormous. Yeah, it made Steve Donnie his worst of the year list last year. It did, okay. Yeah, so I was like, man, how bad could it be? You know, and it's not a, you know, Donnie likes early John Irving. You know, and he doesn't even like early Stephen King. Yeah, but yeah, Irving's great. And uh, you know, I guess John Irving took a creative writing class from Kurt Vonnegut. Really? Okay. Yeah, and apparently he said that uh, Vonnegut was a really unusual writer because they wrote a novel in his class, and Vonnegut read all the novels. And he said, you'd sit there and you'd, you'd re- go through it to look for his markups and stuff in the novel. And you'd go through 100 pages and Vonnegut would have written one note outside one paragraph. This made me laugh. <laughs> and then it'd be 100 pages before Vonnegut had written anything else. Well, you know, Vonnegut is he's his own style. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that, that's another subject. But one of the other things about what did you think of the Ellen Jameson Society? You know, that was really weird because I can't really compare them with too much that I recognize in the real world. You know, that's just so extreme. It is. I mean, it was just, and it became so extreme, I mean, that he, he again, he was pushing the, the, the envelope a little bit there, try, trying to show how important it was to some women just why don't you pay attention to the violence happening to women? Right. Doing violence unto themselves. Right, right. Yeah, and Garp had no use for them at all. No, he he he, he really thought they were off the edge. And I think they were off the edge. And my question is, like, again, I'm not old enough to truly understand what was going on in 1979 with women. Right. I mean, I would have been I was born in 1964, so young, yeah. still a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was nine years old in 79, so. Yeah, so. But I, I found that just, just very fascinating. And I think that's where, where, where Garp was going, is that when he, in the beginning, about the, the feminine is going gonna, is gonna to just, Peter out because it's no longer going to be relevant anymore. That we're just- right, yeah, everybody's going to come to their senses. And essentially, that's sort of what happened with the Ellen Jameson, is that they eventually just came to their senses and stopped doing it. Yeah, they had their own epilogue. They were in that epilogue section that we were talking about earlier. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you've read The Leftovers. I can't remember the author's name. The, the title is Ringing a Bell. He's a famous author. Um, he wrote Election, and, I believe, and Tracy Flick Can't Win, but I can't remember his name. But The Leftovers is, is a story about how one day 10% of everybody disappears. They just disappear. Like it's the rapture or something, but they don't shoot up into space or whatever. And so everybody else is kind of left behind wondering what happened to everybody. And there's a certain society of people who start dressing all in white and never speak again and start smoking cigarettes. And they were clearly inspired by that. Hmm. It's a whole different situation. And they don't literally cut their tongues out. Hmm. Which is exactly what Garp suggested they should have done in the first place. You can still decide not to speak, you know, but you don't have to mutilate yourself to do that. Right. And then again, it's like that whole society was geared up 
towards the end of the the sister. Um, the one who wore diapers until she was like 15 or 14. Oh, yeah. Um, Pooh. Pooh. And how she joined the Ellen Jameson Society right. after thinking that Garp ruined her life. And of course, I mean, this is this is basically a spoiler review. It's like, you know, she's the one that killed him at the end. And right. Yeah. Well, and that holds true in the movie too. Uh, it's it's a really it's a really detailed novel. There's a lot that happens in it. There is, and it's a, it's a, it's a good example of a of a novel that was made into a movie, but the movie couldn't possibly hold everything from the novel, so it leaves out probably half of it. And uh, I believe they're working on a miniseries version for HBO. Which I think will work really well because they did that with Olive Kitteridge, which is, which is another great book, and uh, and it worked out great for Olive Kitteridge. Yeah, I, I I read portions of Olive Kitteridge because it's short. I mean, it's not a novel; it's short stories. Yeah, it's a collection of short stories. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I read the second uh, collection of short stories, mm -hmm. Olive Again, I think is the name of it. Yeah. I it but, but yeah, it was great. Yeah, all right. Well, well, as I said. We're about half hour in. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. If you haven't read The World According to Garp, I would highly recommend it. I it, it I mean, is. You know, I don't really give star ratings, but it would be pretty close to a five star rating for me. Yeah, it's pretty close to perfect. I, I mean, I can't read it and say, "Oh, I would have done this differently," or "He really screwed the pooch here." It, it was well crafted. It was a well crafted novel. He cares about words and sentences. He does. I I think it's one of the cases where it deserved the national. Book. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I ha I have not read his um competitors for the year. Maybe you can go back and look at it. But I think it's a great book. So yeah, it really was. Right. I, I hope people watching this found some value in our little book talk of this. Well, I hope they read The World According to Garp if they haven't read it already. If you haven't, I it, it's a highly recommended book. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good. Okay. Well, this was fun. Thanks was for inviting fun. me to do this. This I, is my first real buddy read. Yeah, you know, normally when we do buddy reads, we do it on like a boxer or email. Right. I think, I think we should do more video buddy reads. I yeah, yeah, know. absolutely. Well, let's pick another book then. Let's pick another book. And watchers, thank you for so much. Yeah. If you watch this. You know, if you if you get to the end of this and you're still watching, why not give a thumbs up emoji at the end? Just so we know that you got to the end. Of the Feed video. my ego. Feed our ego. All right. Uh, thank you for watching, everyone. Keep all right. Me. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody who watched.